This is Catherine Schneider from the Fitchburg Historical Society, and we are so happy to be continuing our series with um, city planner uh, Tom Hovell, former city planner, but a city planner for many, many years in the in the uh, city of Fitchburg from 1986 to 2018, if I have that correct, Tom. Um, so we have been doing this series because Tom is is the expert on uh, how the city has evolved from a uh, township, uh, originally uh, organized as a township, and then grown into uh, uh, the entity of a city, how how then they carried forward with the planning for the city as it uh, continued to grow and evolve. So this morning, um, Tom is going to be uh, focusing on, on really planning as a city and what was involved with that. So welcome, uh, welcome, Tom. Um, first question I'd like to ask you, knowing that uh, the Fitchburg um, uh, transitioned into uh, being a city in 1983, and you came aboard in 1986, so you were right there at the origins of, uh, of the city. How did planning evolve over the course of time from a town to a city? Can you speak to that? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. You are right. I was there from 86 to 2018, so 32 years. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting that um, some things changed, some things didn't. And I think the things that didn't change were very core, and that was community input, and being a data-driven process. You can see some of that, although to a much lesser degree than what we would do in the 2000s, but you saw that with the 1983 or 1984 and the 1995 uh, general land use plans, there was a lot of community input, not near as much as we had with the 2000 plan, but there was still a good deal of, amount of it. Um, so the, those were, they, those combined, that planning effort combines both the subjective, you know, community input, with the objective, the data. And people take through those meetings, you know, can see the data and help inform the process. So it's kind of the data informing the public opinion, so to speak. Um, so th that um, the planning's always been fond of maps, tables, charts, graphs, things like that, a lot of data in both graphic form, particularly mapping. And I think probably the biggest way things changed is how data is presented. Now we use uh, geographic information systems or GIS to produce maps, but that's a much more powerful tool than just producing maps. It has some statistical capabilities within it and other things that you can all, you not, I don't wanna say manipulate the data, but you can combine data and get and map it in different ways that you would never been able to as easily and, and presentable as you can through GIS. So the other th big thing that's changed is the amount of data that's available to us. And obviously a lot of this is through the internet, but it's much more easily accessible because of the internet. But uh, there's a, a, a good deal of data that's much more available that we can use and almost gets to the point of data overload but you just have to know how to kind of balance and take what you have that's you think will be important. The other thing that's always been important are projections uh, in land use planning. Uh, we always, we tended to rely on uh, the Regional Planning Commission now known as CARPC, Capillary Regional Planning Commission, to help us with our projections because basically what happens is the uh, Department of Administration um, takes the state, they come up with state projections, then they start allocating that down to the county level and the CARP-C helps them allocate it to each individual community. So we're not doing this isolated, we're doing our projections based on what CARP-C and the DOA come up with from the county and how that allocates to each individual community. And of course, things can change over time. You may meet, you may not meet your projections, but that's what they are. They're projections that are necessary to help us focus on what we're planning for and how we're going to plan. So, but I think the main key is, is that is the, um, probably the thing, even though we've always had public input is how it changed over time. It was much less, you know, like large, big groups. And we focused more on getting smaller group and people, breaking people into smaller groups and getting their input and becoming much more interactive. And you saw that with a number of the exercises we did 
with the 2000, what would become the 2009 comprehensive plan. And I'll touch on one of those exercises a little later in our uh, discussion. All right, great. Thank you, Tom. My, the tools that have become available to help with uh, help with the planning and those two um, components of public input and data and putting them together to come out with the best plan possible. Um, mm -hmm. So what are some of the key so concepts that you desired to obtain through your planning? What were you looking for? Yeah, as the community evolved, so did some of the concepts that it found is important. I think last time I touched on probably the key concept that was always present in Fitchburg and I saw through my tenure as planner was preservation of the rural area. Uh, that is what people view. If you ask Fitchburg, people in Fitchburg, residents of Fitchburg, what do you think of Fitchburg? A lot of times it's not any growth in the urban area or anything like that. It's that rural component, which we discussed quite a bit last, uh, last presentation. So that continued. That was, you know, with farmland preservation and exclusive egg zoning. Uh, then we also had guidelines for construction of outside the urban service area. And they've been with us. Those guidelines have been with us. All the, they have changed over time, but they've been with us. I think it was in the 1984 uh, plan. There may have even been some in the 1970, I think it was 74 plan or 72 plan. So, and then, so we had our future growth areas. And then I think sewer. Uh, has always made a, played a main role. Uh, Fitchburg is, tends to be, except for one instance, uh, all gravity flowed sewer, which is rather unique within the county for a city of our size. Um, we took a longer term view. The council actually mandated that we for the 2009 plan, we, instead of looking out like 20 years, which is or 10 to 20 years, which is typical, we went out 50 years. Uh, we looked for mixed use neighborhoods. What I mean by that, we have neighborhood plans. And, occupy, oh, say somewhere like 600 to 800 acres or so, or given an approximate, they all vary. But what you wanted to do was have mixed use neighborhoods where you had some commercial, you had residential and various densities of residential as well within each neighborhood. So that each, not one, there was not just one pocket of multifamily like we saw that came about in the 1970s when everything was right up at the north edge of the city. And, so you, you can kind of see there's some changes from the 1984, 1985, or 95 plan. And that's just the term general itself kind of gives this malleable kind of idea, right? I mean, it just says general land use plan. So, you know, there was, you know, the community had to become more accepting of planning over time. Um, and I think that's kind of seen going from the, with the terminology, general land use plan, even some of the policymakers didn't want to, want to, they want to have certainty, but they don't because they want to be able to change something real easily when they wanted to. And that kind of changed in 2000 when the state came up with a comprehensive plan statute. And that statute required communities that are over a certain size, I don't remember the size limit now, I think it was 5,000, that if you do any type of land use control, so zoning and land division would fall into that, then you had to have a comprehensive plan and they gave you certain guidelines to follow, certain nine elements that had to be attended to. And so around that time then, we, you know, things kind of changed in the planning field remarkably because all of a sudden the state saying, now you've got to do this, which, which was probably in the end, I think a good thing. And it was a good move by Governor Thompson to do that. Um, and you got more certainty because all of a sudden now when you did your plan, it wasn't as easy to change as those general land use plans. So you had to be, you had to have more public input. Well, not necessarily more, but you had to have public input and you had to be more, uh, how do we want to put it? You had to, you had to think more about how you were planning because you didn't want to be making plans that wouldn't suffice over the long term, right? So you had to be, and then you became more creative, I think. I think that uh, caused some more creativity to come in. So other concepts that changed, uh, you know, we talked about the complexity that there's the complexity of the urban growth. So that's, that's more, and that caused us to change some strategies that we had because urban growth and what was required by CARP-C and so forth was changing over that time. 
in getting urban service adjustments and other things. And so we also saw that the type of services that we provide, um, water, fire protection, parks, just some of the important issues <clears throat> and sanit as I mentioned, sanitary sewer. And, you know, for example, it was determined that it was cheaper to close fire station number two, which is way on the west side of Fitchburg and build two new fire stations because now we had to go to a, we went to a fully manned fire department from an all volunteer fire department that I don't remember the year that happened, but that was triggered by some fires up in uh, the Ridgewood uh, apartment projects up off of Traceway Drive. We also looked at wells and water facilities because you have cones of depression that can affect lakes and streams and so forth. Um, so that's a lot of some of the data that was available. And as gas prices increased, we started looking at population density and how important that is to try to obtain at least some pockets of the city that could support more bus service. And then bus service also helps those that are residents that are disenfranchised or may become disenfranchised. You know, there, uh, there, I remember some of the meetings we had there were people that, you know, had a severe accident, become, became severe, you know, handicapped, couldn't get around, they had, but they still wanted to live in their home. And, you know, that was became a very controversial issue when Mayor Morris said it proposed some additional bus service because some people didn't want buses. And then you had those that had become disenfranchised. And I remember one resident actually saying, well, then you should move. They said to that to the person that was, uh, that was had become handicapped. Um, and the other thing uh, we started doing is we started planning more for bike and walking. And when I took over in Fitchburg, you, there were no sidewalks. And one of my first actions as a city planner was to come up with a sidewalk policy. Uh, then that kind of got changed by the council to a two city policy. So it was called that you can put them in, in uh, multifamily areas. So eventually we got to the point where we were putting sidewalks in new subdivisions that happened in the nineties. So I think, and I think that's been a good thing. I think it's shown that walking is a much, is a fair, very favorable activity for people like my age and others that you know retire and they like to walk and that's kind of that ability to get outside and it makes it a lot easier when you have sidewalks in some of the streets than when you don't. And of course there's biking and we went really made a move into biking too with a lot of bike paths and you know it's even now to the point where several years ago the chamber picked up that whole biking issue and bike the bird type thing. I recall I was biking up in Sheboygan area this summer and I picked up a map that the state had and uh, there's a little fold out map or little booklet and had little ads and it was Fishburg Chamber bike the bird. So, you know, it was kind of interesting to think while well, I was part of that uh, in the planning of those bike paths. Um, so I, I want to say one thing is that um, the mixed use planning, what it allowed us to do, what it allowed us to better to meet and change with market demand. So if you were planning only large single family subdivisions um, and then you get hit by a re significant recession as we did in that great recession years of you know, 07 to 10, you know, the single family housing market just fell apart. And I recall driving in Sun Prairie and just seeing uh, large single family subdivisions with a lot of streets, no homes, others with some homes that have been raided and, and you know, the copper taken out and stuff like that, you know, partially built homes that were never occupied. Um, so it's not like it was a, a thing that what happened was unique to other parts of this country. It was, it was happening here in Dane County. So it allowed us to be able to meet in because we allowed for multifamily construction. And so that took over and that, and I know a lot of people criticize we had a lot of multifamily, but we we were meeting market demand and we had planned it that way to be able to meet market demand because we had these mixed use neighborhoods that said you can do multifamily here or as long as you met and some that would change over time to saying to the neighborhood uh, plan. When you do the neighborhood plan, you come up with, we give you a density level and then you meet it. How you meet it, it's up to you. So that's much more of a free market approach. And that would happen in, with the McGaugh neighborhood plan as an example. Um, but we also became more cautious about timing of urban service area adjustments, for example. 
because you, you, there's a lot of expense to put in a new urban service, to expand your urban service area. You have a lot of services that have to be extended. And if those services aren't used for several years, you got a lot of infrastructure that's sitting empty. <clears throat> so that's an important kind of concept. And so, you know, a lot of, we were more gradual in our urban, in our future growth areas, I think, than what some other communities were. So that timing becomes important over time. And uh, we put some trigger mechanisms in, our, in the comprehensive plan. For example, on, on average, over five years, you grow about 75 acres. And th that was a rather controversial concept at the time um, because people thought it would inhibit growth. But I think what it also did, it made us grow smarter and better. And I don't know that at least my tenure there that we ever surpassed that 75 acres per year. Um, but I think we were getting close, but you know, it was still, it was still a functionable activity. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on here is when we were doing the comprehensive plan, I talked a little bit about density and the mixed use neighborhoods. And one of the reasons that we, we led, led us to that, well, we had some ideas in our back of our mind, you know, the bus service and things like that, and, and getting some maybe commercial, small levels of commercial activity in new neighborhoods. But we did a housing exercise, um, and I don't remember what the year it was. It was one of the early sessions that we did for our comprehensive plan. So it was probably the early part of the 2000s, like 2004, maybe. Um, and we broke, we had a number of people from the community, it was really good, well attended. And we broke them into small groups. And so what we said is, okay, we know DOA is telling us, CARPC is telling us we're gonna grow say 5,000 people every decade. So what kind of housing options do you want available to meet that 5,000 people? And so we, we had a, done a lot of calculations and figured, you know, so for example, if you're building at three to four, say four dwelling units per acre, which is kind of a standard suburban subdivision in Fitchburg, you know, this is how much land you take. And we added in a multiplier to add it for the streets, the stormwater basins, things like that, the parks. And so, people are given the kind of like squares and said, this is like represents so many hundreds of dwelling units or whatever, I had three to four dwelling units per acre. So we said, you know, take these things and this is what I mean by interactive and map out how you want Fitchburg to grow. So most of the groups, they were intent on having what they know best, which is three to four dwelling units per acre. We, you know, we did have some multifamily people attend, but the bulk of the residents were in single family homes and they laid it out. And they were astounded at how much land would have been taken in the rural area if you're developing at three to four dwelling units per acre. And so we, you know, we combined all the groups and we, and this is the neat thing about GAS, it didn't take long. You know, we could take their maps, combine it and map it out and kind of do overlays in GIS and show it to them. And everybody was astounded. So they said, so we said, do you want to change things? And they said, yes, yes, we do, because that rural land component's important to us. So they went back and they changed and they came up with a density of about eight dwelling units per acre, which just happened to be kind of was the thought at the time that you need to help meet bus service. So that doesn't mean you don't have subdivisions that are three or four dwelling units per acre. It means that in your neighborhood plan, you might have some areas that are. 15 to 20 or more dwelling units per acre, some apartments, and but you also but you also have areas that are say four dwelling or five dwelling units per acre or whatever. And some of the best new development we see, I think, over in Terra Vesta, they're probably you know like six or eight dwelling units per acre. So I think that was a key concept. And I think really people, when you start laying it out, you know, what you think, what you envision, and you see how, what it takes, it, you know, it, it was a real eye-opener with people. And I think that was probably the best exercise of all the many exercises we did, the best one that really got people in the, in the public to understand what's at stake when you grow in just, the, you know, your familiar mode. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that was a concept, I think, that then garnered speed, that whole idea, because if you can grow it, uh, seven or eight dwelling units per acre, you're saving half your land than if you grow at four dwelling units per acre. You know, you get 100% more land that you're using at uh, to at four units per acre to meet the same dwelling units if you're doing it at eight units per acre. 
So that was kind of a long discussion, but I, I thought that was rather important to point out how there's where the public informed our growth in a, in a, in a real meaningful way, our growth policy, the growth policies the city would adopt in a meaningful way. And really making it possible for them to see uh, through through your model how things would change if if they had the concept of what they had seen already and continued with that pattern, how that would impact Fitchburg. So uh, really informing people and then having them work through from their new information how how they could re envision uh, the way Fitchburg would would be able to grow then and maintain the um, uh, those values of the rural areas being maintained. So interesting, interesting to have the public really become informed and a part of the process, Tom. Um, I'd like to ask, you mentioned uh, resource-based planning and why, uh, why is that important and maybe some of the key elements to that? Okay. Uh, Resource-based planning is an idea that I came up with when we we're working on the 2009 comprehensive plan, because I thought there has to be a better thing than simply looking at growing out contiguously as a lot of times we had done from our urban service area, because does that really take into account some of the specifics of the situation that's provided on the ground? Okay, so when I mean the provided on the ground, I mean each area in each basin or sub basin within the city. So watershed or sub watershed, I mean by basin, have their own unique characteristics, their own challenges. So, for example, over in the Stoner area, Stoner Prairie part of the city, um, that any stormwater there, if it because it's so flat, if it leaves, it goes down to a closed basin in Oregon. And so the more water you send down to that closed basin, then all of a sudden you're flooding out that, I can't remember the name of the lake, Hook Lake or something. You're flooding out that lake and they got homes around that lake. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, are you complicit then in flooding of homes in high water or significant water events like we had just a few years ago? And as we had, remember the Lake Delton Dam busting. So um, that we were we were thinking ahead, you know, to, to avoid those type of those uh, type of climatic events that have become seemingly more and more common every five to ten years, rather than every fifty or a hundred years. Uh, but we didn't look just at you know the the streams. We, well, we looked we looked at the streams. We looked at their how they were um, classified by the DNR, the terms of the classification of the stream, because stream quality is impacted by development. Even with all of the storm basins and everything else we do, it's still impacted by development. And so we looked at the stream quality classification. So there's graphs that we had in that 2009 plan that show you know, at what point you start degrading a stream in terms of its percent of, um, of the basin, the watershed that's developed versus non. And so those are all, so we kind of took that watershed planning tool and helped it inform our land use planning. Um, we looked at historic sites, water, sewer, um, fire, EMS service, all of those things, uh, parks even. And so it wasn't just environmental or natural resource, but we looked at cultural factors too. <clears throat> and so we could map these out and figure out and try to play with them and then the, we came up with several different growth models based on <clears throat> through of resource planning for urban growth, how we would grow in the future based on these different qualities. And the plan commission took those, ended up coming up with a map um, that kind of combined some, you kind of move things around to best meet uh, what they thought would be wise. And, you know, we looked at wetlands, wetland buffers. Uh, I think it was Bill Horns, former alderman, that you know, kind of came up with an idea of what different, several different things we should meet. And one of those with 300 foot buffers around our wetlands to be able to protect the wetlands and keep the water quality good. Because wetlands do, you know, 50, 60 years ago, people didn't really know what wetlands serve, but today they serve, they realize they serve a much more important part uh, than what was once thought. You know, remember they used to be called wasteland or marshland. Now we, now the term, wetland is much more acceptable. 
So that's kind of what we try to do with the uh, resource place planning. And then you, we do that at a kind of a higher level with the comprehensive plan and coming up with our growth areas. And then when we did our neighborhood plans, we did a much more deeper dive into it um, to try to figure out how best to grow given the resource limitations. So it was traffic too. I mean, you know, you, and the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to be grow, outgrowing your ability to provide services. Otherwise, people get mad. You know, if you're if their water pressure is too low, or if you can't get your the water that you need to fight a fire in a neighborhood, that's not a good thing. Or if you're sitting in traffic jams all the time, that's not a good thing either. Some of that is unavoidable because you know you can't. It's hard to plan for growth beyond us in some of the major arteries. And you depend on the county and uh, DOT to take the lead on some of those, but you know we can we can certainly help by trying to do things, making things more about uh, get more biking, to get more uh, uh, transit friendly neighborhoods developed as well. So, but by its very geography, um, we attract many people. Because of, you know, like we talked about that before the last time, you know, about our, just our geography, we tend to be an attraction for many people and many things because we, we have those hills, we have the forests, we have the woods. And so that's why it makes it even more important to do that uh, resource based planning. And uh, it brought in other stakeholders. You know, I think Fitchburg is rather unique in how we had so many stakeholders from outside of our community come in and give input to what we were doing. And I got some people, some policymakers in the city who weren't real happy about that. But I always took the view that, uh, you know, they thought it was meddling. I always took the view, well, our plan should be able to stand up to scrutiny. And if, to be able to get more input, regardless of who it's from, certainly helps that. Mm -hmm. So many factors, so many factors to take into consideration, layer upon layer. Um, reminds me of a, a chessboard in a way, you know, so many things to look at in making these plans, Tom. Um, can you expand on the connection between the comprehensive plan and the urban service adjustments? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so the comprehensive plan, I think Mark Sewell, our city attorney at the time, but it's kind of like our land use constitution. So that sits up here. And then you've got other things that look to implement and that but have to be consistent with. So any action we take land use wise has to be consistent with our comprehensive plan. So this is one of the things I talked about the creativity, you know, is how do you do the density? So we came up as we did uh, as we did our um, neighborhood plans and the neighborhood plans are required by CARP C, you know, and I, I think we would do, we were doing them anyway, but CARP C started requiring. In fact, you know, that whole resource planning thing that I was talking about, CARPC actually ended up taking our idea and even built on it and started asking other communities to do it so that they had a much better idea of where and how they were going to grow than just saying, oh, we're just going to grow in Farmer X's field. You know, don't, don't let Farmer X drive it or the developer that wants to buy Farmer X's field. The community should be the one saying, this is where we want to grow. And that's what we did. You know, we, it was the community driven process of saying these are the areas we're going to grow <clears throat> um it becomes a timing issue because some farmers may not want to sell at that or some landowners may want to develop some may not but it's still it, it's addressing your policy needs and your community needs so that's why i think carp c started requiring that for um, other communities and with urban service adjustments and so that comprehensive plans, a main document. And so it gives out our goals, objectives, and policies, each a little more formal than the one above. So it gets a little more detailed, but not near the level of detail that we do with a neighborhood plan. Um, it puts more meat on the bones, so to speak. You know, a neighborhood plan, we're adding more things and we're getting more specific in terms of transportation, water, sanitary sewer. Uh, storm water you know when we get down to we know where our storm ponds are going to be and we know pretty much an idea of size you know it's, it's become fairly simple now to be able to do that and particularly with the mapping capabilities we have you know you know your watershed basis you can figure out what your density you know be, because you have your density idea you can figure out how big your pond's going to need to be and uh, things like that 
And so you can do that same thing. We do uh, transportation calculations. You know, we have transportation um, um, traffic impact analysis done when we do neighborhood plans and things like that at a more detailed level. Um, so when it gets down to CARP C, they're main goal is basically water quality so it's sanitary sewer and um, also uh, wetland protection stream protection things like that but I th I'd say the real big one is probably sanitary sewer and we're fortunate that uh, Fitchburg doesn't have its own sanitary treatment plant we're served by the Ma Madison Metropolitan Sewage District and so you know, we have a large interceptor that's owned by MMSD, the Nine Springs Valley Interceptor that runs through the north part of the city and serves, you know, the whole west side of Madison and Verona go and feed into that. So it's it's much more than just Fitchburg that's uh, served by that. And then we have our own interceptors. You know, we've got the, the McKee Interceptor. We've got the one over on the east side and the Nine Springs Interceptor, things like that. You know, a plan and based on how we could grow so we know that we will have future capacity. So that's kind of that whole part when not, the comprehensive plan is saying, hey, this is where we're going to grow. So now when you do that neighborhood plan, you're going to make sure you're not just planning the capacity of the sewer for you, that area that's to the north because it the, 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 the tends to flow north, the, the, the gravity flow, but for the neighborhood that's going to be below it so that that can have capacity. So you're not trying to Put in a relief interceptor or something like that later on. So that's it's really putting more meat on the bones is what it gets down to, and you get much more detail. Well, the, one of the things that we did later on, instead of setting forth, I touched on this, instead of setting forth specific density areas, we started saying, okay, you you this area you meet five units per acre. I think the McGaw plan is a perfect example, and this unit you meet. 10 dwelling units per acre or something like that. So you knew where you're going to have lower or more, but you had to meet have those as minimum. So we started setting minimum density. And so you can, there's a certain point you reach when your density kind of off balances. And so it might have some minimal impact on your stormwater basins or some impact, but it's usually able to be handled because you still have to do some on-site stormwater now with, through uh, state and county regulations and do some, and then we have our bigger basins that are offsite. So it's all kind of planned within the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. And then some planning elements have remained constant um, over the course of time. And can you explain those to us? Yeah, I think I touched on a number of these in the uh, first session, but I think the, the probably the one, the two or three concepts really that have remained constant over time in Fitchburg. One is farmland preservation and exclusive egg zoning. And we delved into that quite a bit. And why is that important? Well, it's because that whole rural area thing, right? Is preserving our rural area. We saw it uh, with the 84 plan, or actually going back to the 70s, that 70 plan in the 1970s, we saw it. We saw it the 84, we saw it 95, and it carried over to the 2009 comprehensive plan as well. That they have our growth, we have our um, farmland preservation and egg zoning. We have exclusive egg zoning, as I mentioned, we're the only city in the nation to or in the state to have exclusive egg zoning. Well, maybe Windsor, well, Windsor's a village, so um, they incorporated a few years ago. Um, the other concept is the whole idea of the urban service area. And so that's a holdover back again from the that 1970 plan. And when they first developed that concept, it was based on gravity flow uh, sewers. And so it's kind, of, it's kind of that whole concept of mainly gravity flow sewers has continued in our planning. We do have, there is one list station that's over in Terra Vesta. They could have done a gravity flow sewer, but it would have called, it caused a much, very deep cut. So they went with the list station, you know, deep cut through a, a minor, through a hill. But, um, um, so the other thing then was uh, concept was the minimizing growth outside the urban service area, again, to help protect that rural. So you can see that whole idea of helping preserve that rural area, that rural identity, you know, keeping part of that value, how that plays through all of our planning. 
And then, uh, you know, even though we did natural resource protection in the 2000s, we, we took it to a much different level. It was much higher than we did before. That doesn't mean that it wasn't done years ago, because years ago, we looked at slope and soil suitability, things like that. We didn't certainly look at it to the level we look at things in, for the 2000 plan in terms of, you know, get delving down more into biological details and things like that. But uh, we did have some of that. So. Um, so I'd say those are the main concepts that we tried to preserve, and they all get back to that whole what's that Fitchburg value that that rural area. Mm -hmm. Tom, thank you so much. There's just um, a tremendous amount that goes into planning and the detail work that you've done through these many years to make Fitchburg. Um, uh, is growth uh, very well planned out, very well thought out and into the future um, so that the community is is well taken care of in terms of how how it uh, it grows, that smart growth idea, um, all the details that go into it and and informing us about that. Um, you're just a, a, a wealth of, of information about that. So thank you so much for your time this morning. And we'll look forward to our third um, interview with you, which is coming up next month. And we will um, be doing some of the implementation with the zoning and, um, and land division codes and so on. So um, thank you so much for your time this morning. Oh, you're welcome, Catherine. And a lot of, a lot of the credit goes actually to the, the Fitchburg residents who uh, we're active and involved, and uh, you know, a good plan requires that public input. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, and allowing for that to be such a center central piece to to the planning process that the residents are intimately engaged in that and invited into that process. Um, I would like to just mention that. Um, the, um, the interview with Tom, the interviews, the series of interviews uh, will be on our website, the Fitchburg Historical Society's website, which is fitchburghistory.org. Lots of other interesting things are on that site too. So we hope uh, people avail themselves uh, to that and, and enjoy um, just delving into our, our website also. So thank you so much again, Tom. Yep, thank you, Catherine. See ya.